This is the fifth lecture of a series of keynote lectures on the face of the Earth. We had very interesting keynote lectures during, on the previous days of the week on the rocks, water, on life, the atmosphere, and the topic for today is space, the face of the Earth and space. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome today's keynote speaker, James Head, who will give, uh, will give this keynote lecture, please. Thank you, Gunther. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's amazing what we've learned in over 50 years, actually 57 years since the launch of Sputnik. Some of you, actually nobody in this room probably remembers it, uh, but if you listen to that sound in the background, that revolutionized our lives, okay? So the first orbiting spacecraft by the Soviet Union really set the stage for the lecture today because in the short period of time that since that happened, uh, in fact, 50 years, there were two parallel revolutions in understanding uh, the Earth and the planets. The first one was global plate tectonics, the perception of the Earth as a planet. This was incredibly revolutionary. I can remember as an undergraduate trying to, freshman undergraduate, trying to realize what Benioff zones were without a context of the rest of the planet. Of course, we know now, global plate tectonics. The second was the space age, the Earth in the context of the solar system. Imagine that. There are other planetary bodies. We need to understand the context of our own home planet Earth. You are here, and that's where we'll spend a lot of time in the next few minutes. But I want to set the stage for going to these other planetary bodies. Because in this 57 years of space missions, we have had incredible launches. Uh, in fact, each one of these circles and lines represents a single mission to these other planetary bodies. And it's just stunning when you look at this, OK? Look at all these missions to the moon, to Venus, uh, to Mercury, to the sun, to Mars, to the outer planets, to stopping on the way, as it were, to look at asteroids and their characteristics, the building blocks of life, to comets, and so on. We've landed on the moon six times, six times. And each of those we have, in fact, with humans, and we have, in fact, explored extensively in significant exploration expeditions. <clears throat> and of course, the 57 years since the launch of Sputnik saw this great revolution uh, in our understanding of the Earth as a planet. I don't have to tell you what this means. You've heard it earlier this week. And of course, you know from your freshman textbooks, et cetera, uh, that we have a really good idea of what's going on on the Earth as a planet. We know that crust is created at divergent plate boundaries at the uh, spreading centers. Uh, it moves laterally at very high rates geologically. And in fact, it's subducted under uh, continental regions and uh, subducted back down into the mantle. We have a very good idea of how the seafloor forms, how continents form in the broadest sense, uh, and in fact, lots of other aspects of the Earth as a planet. What we don't know, of course, is the formative years. The good news is we can go out and look at all these kinds of things very uh, extensively because the rates are so high. We can go to Iceland. We can watch these things. We can dive to the bottom of the seafloor, see how the divergent plate boundaries are working and what's coming up, et cetera. But weathering and plate tectonics is so efficient that it has destroyed the record of the first half of solar system history. This is critical. It's like getting a book with only the last few chapters uh, in the book. You don't know what happened. Nobody, there's no dramatis persona. You don't know what happened with the, in the formative years, what the early period was like. We don't know how the Earth came to be the way it is because the missing chapters in Earth history have been long erased. So that's a quest, OK? When did plate tectonics start? How and when did continents really form? What were the underpinnings of what we see at the surface today? What was the early atmosphere like? And when and where, where indeed, did life originate? These are all the kind of questions that we have. And when we think about this clock here, starting with the origin of the Earth and working around in a 12-hour day to the present, the vast majority of the geological record was created in the last 200 million years, the ocean basin, 60% in the last 200 years. That's incredible. 60% of our planet is less than a few percent of the age of the planet. Good news is we can study it and understand it. The bad news is we don't have a clue what's going on here in many, many ways. Well, how do we get to understand what this is? Where is the record of the major processes operating in the first half of solar system history? Planets and moons were soon to come into being, so to speak, uh, to join Earth as objects of geological interest and analysis. Previously, they've been astronomical objects. Now they became geological objects as we tried to understand what was going on there. And indeed, the field of comparative planetology was born. What happens with planets as they go from distance from the sun, close to the sun, to far from the sun, uh, in terms of their initial starting conditions, as well as incident solar radiation in their present environments? 
why do planets, what happens when planets differ in size? Are the large ones the same characteristics in evolution as the small ones? What about the density? Whoa, wait, why is Mercury the same density as <coughs> Venus and the Earth, even though it's only a third of the diameter? These are the kind of compelling questions uh, that we have, and this is what we try to understand in comparative planetology. These are the questions that we ask. These are very, very simple and very, very fundamental questions. How are planets formed? What's their density and internal structure? What factors govern their evolution? How do they gain and lose heat? How do they get heat? How do they get rid of heat? Key in their thermal evolution. Uh, how do they gain and, uh, in fact, evolve and retain atmospheres? Kind of important for us as we sit here today to try to figure out our own home planet. What are the basic stages in their evolution? How do they compare to each other? And how do they evolve together as a system? This is really important, too, because there are many factors which uh, are common to all the planetary bodies. What environments and conditions are most conducive to life, both the origin of life, the evolution of life, the preservation of life, and, uh, in fact, why we are what we are today? These are the kinds of things that compel all of us in comparative planetology and also in Earth analyses. So I want to summarize for you today some of the findings of the last 57 years of exploration. It's just been an amazing time, and the future is so bright in terms of our uh, reaching out to other systems around other stars that is just, just incredibly compelling. Now, I'm going to focus on the terrestrial planet. Those are the Earth-like planets. They're the smaller terrestrial bodies here you can see in contrast to the outer gas giants. So we'll focus on these planets to give you a summary of some of what's been going on. We can look at these in terms of the position in the solar system, as I said before, starting with the sun and working outwards. How do they change as a function of this distance? We can also look at them in terms of size, okay? The Earth and Venus are the two largest, whereas Mercury, Mars, and the Moon are one-half the diameter or less than that of the Earth. Uh, so we can try to understand these in this context. And what we'll do today is start with the Moon, the smallest one, work our way up in size towards the Earth to try to fill in this period uh, this increasing size till we get to something we know about the Earth. So let's take a look first at the Moon. <clears throat> it's one quarter the diameter of the Earth. It's our closest neighbor. Here we are right here, so you can see it up in the sky. It's pretty impressive, okay? And of course, exploration of the Moon was born out of the space age. The U.S.-Soviet uh, essentially conflict and race to the Moon, a very real thing, wonderful to talk about sometime. But in fact, dozens of missions here, uh, represented by these Soviet pens, uh, and also Apollo astronauts, this is what really spurred us on to understand a lot about planetary exploration. And indeed, it was a scientific exploration by both countries. <clears throat> there were six Apollo missions, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. These form a cornerstone to our understanding of another planetary body. The moon is really a touchstone for solar system science. We can look at the moon, understand a lot of things, and extrapolate that out to where we have less knowledge, like Mercury, the moon, and Mars. These missions were, in fact, scientific exploration expeditions. This is too often forgotten. My first job out of grad school was working in the Apollo program in astronaut training, site selection, mission operations, and then debriefing the astronauts when they got back. What a lucky time to be alive. Totally amazing. These people, totally motivated people, incredible observers. One Jack Schmidt was a geologist. The rest were just amazing observers and very highly motivated. And they brought back a treasure trove of rocks because of their training, and also they ended up, of course, hundreds of kilos of rocks, as well as, 20, in this case and the others, 20-some kilometers across the surface of the moon. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to drive on the moon 25 kilometers to see what was there, to understand why we had these sinuous rills, all these other types of things? They did it, and the results are stunning. They form the cornerstone for this exploration <clears throat> and understanding of these other planetary bodies. We found lunar rock types. First of all, the maria, the dark areas, are formed from basalt, extrusive lava flows. Uh, on the surface of the moon, forming about 17% of the surface of the moon, whereas the bright highlands were formed of anorthosite, norite, and troctolite. And indeed, these intrusive igneous rocks are modified on the surface by impacts, impact cratering. All the yellow units and orange units in here are impact cratering units, which form breaches and impact melts. So we have a fundamental intrusive highlands crust modified by impact cratering uh, in the earliest history of the planet. And when was that? Well, it turns out that the Maria, the highlands, formed in the first few hundred million years of the history of the moon. This is the record we've been looking for. This is, tells us what happened during this first period of the formative years of the history of the planets. Later, <clears throat> extrusive lava flows in the second uh, a few hundreds of millions of years uh, resurfaced about 20% of the planet. Now, of course, what we see here is this crust. How did this crust come to be? 
And what happened? Okay, first thing we find is when we look at the characteristics of the moon as a whole, its age and distribution of ages, and geomorphic and geological features, we find no evidence for plate tectonics. Now, so this means that the moon is a one-plate planet. It's a global, unsegmented lithospheric plate. The reason for that, we think, is because the moon has a very high surface area to volume ratio, and it is a very good conductor of heat outward, and it loses heat by conduction and radiation to space. The lithosphere thickens very rapidly early on till it gets to be so thick it can't subduct very, very early. So indeed, we have preserved on a one-plate planet the geological record of what was going on at this time. This is great news. For you plate tectonics fans, don't worry. We're coming to this in a while. There's some evidence of other planetary bodies, but not the moon. So how did all this come about? If we take a look here, we know on the basis of this geological map here that impact cratering is an incredibly important process, incredibly important. This is something we've learned. It obviously affected the Earth. We see things ranging all over the place from thousands of craters. We've mapped you know, all craters larger than 20 kilometers in diameter. You can see here, and there's a density diagram of them. We have these huge basins. This is an impact basin. This is Oriental Basin, 930 kilometers in diameter. You can see the curvature of the moon here. It's huge. It's one of maybe 50 basins like this that occurred in the few, first few hundred million years of the history of the planet. One of my colleagues, Jerry Wasserberg, said one time, I'd really like to get a good view of that when it happened, uh, a side view, probably from Earth, maybe in a bunker on Earth, OK, because this had about 10 million cubic kilometers of ejecta. One million cubic kilometers of rock material were melted and puddled in the middle. Beautiful differentiation there and so on. 50 of these occurred. It wallpapered half the planet with ejecta. These are huge events, and they happened in early Earth. Not only that, but when the basin collapses, it brings up geotherms from depth, isotherms from depth, and in fact, it creates thermal anomalies on the surface of the moon as a whole. Well, how did crustal formation <coughs> occur on the moon? This is critically important. We, we want to know how the crust was in the early history of the Earth. Ross Taylor, some years ago, wrote a really interesting paper in which he subdivided <coughs> planetary crustal formation into three types. Uh, first of all, he said early in the history of uh, planetary bodies, the accretional heat, heat from incoming projectiles, melted a significant part of the outer part of the planet. And the residual uh, flotation crust from that and the uh, solidification of that created a primary crust. So primary crust is essentially uh, impact generated crust and flotation or other aspects. Okay, For the moon, it indeed is the plagioclase and north acidic Felspar flotation crust. That's pretty amazing. It's not like the crust we know on the Earth at all, OK? On the Earth, of course, we know that we have a secondary crust, which is indeed partial melting from the mantle. We know seafloor spreading, volcanic hotspots. They contribute a significant amount to the surface of the planet. <clears throat> and we know the continents are largely made up of tertiary crust, which is essentially reworked primary and secondary crust. But in the case of the Earth, probably reworked primary uh, or secondary crust uh, for sure. So this is a paradigm that's of interest. And indeed, we were able to see that on the moon, we have a record, a, a, essentially a, a laboratory for the study of how primary crusts form. And this is an amazing situation, OK? So here is a cross section that shows some ideas about how all this occurred with melting. In some cases, this is essentially melting all the way to the interior. In some cases, it's partial melting. Here, it's melted all the way to the interior. Here, only parts of the moon are melted. Uh, half the moon is melted. We don't understand fully yet which of these two options is the case, but significant volumes, at least half the planet, was in fact uh, melted. And the plagioclase flotation crust formed uh, in the aftermath of that. There was density inversions, another thing that caused collapse, et cetera, and situations in which the deeper material that settled down formed the core and then re remobilized some of the uh, uh, radioactive elements to produce these later Mare basalts. So this is really amazing. We have a laboratory for the study of primary crusts uh, in the moon. Not only that, we have a recent mission, GRAIL. This is a Bouguet gravity anomaly map. We know the thickness of the crust very well now. We know the variations in the crust. We can actually map out the influence of these red dots, which are the impact basins, on the structure of the crust. So we have a lot of information. This is why the moon is a reference frame for these types of crusts. We also have the secondary crust, that is the partial melting of the mantle. Now, we know there's no plate tectonics, so there's no seafloor spreading or volcanic hotspots. But in fact, what's going on is vertically accumulating basalts, where you get partial melts of the mantle, uh, as you can see in uh, the case here, for example. Um, partial melts of the mantle come up. <clears throat> Remember, there's a low-density crust, so there's a, 
uh, essentially a neutral buoyancy zone at the base of the crust. These uh, diapirs overpressurize and propagate dikes to the surface. Uh, the activity we can date through size frequency distribution of impact craters. And in fact, we see the peaks are of the order of uh, 4 billion to about 2.5 billion years ago, with some little dribbles and drabs coming out later than that. The mean, the, the mean flux for the moon is about 10 to the minus 2 cubic kilometers per year, which is equivalent to what's coming out of Kilauea today. OK, so very low. OK. On the other hand, <laughs> the way this material comes out with this overpressurization can, in fact, take 50,000 years worth of the mean annual flux and pump it out from the subsurface in a year. When this happens, this overpressurization, propagating of a dike, some stall in the crust, when they get to the surface, they're so overpressurized that the vast uh, quantity of magma that comes out is turbulent uh, and, in fact, causes thermal erosion of the surface to create things like 135 kilometer long sinuous rill uh, that is caused by thermal erosion. So really amazing kinds of things. This could be interesting from the Archean point of view as well uh, in terms of how magma comes to the surface and what it does. Is there any tertiary crust uh, on the moon, reworked primary and secondary crust? We're working on that problem. The new data suggests that these domes here, 20 kilometers across, 1,200 meters high, we know these are silicic in composition. We haven't visited them yet, but from the remote sensing data, we do. So we have tertiary crust as well. Some kind of reworked primary and secondary crust. Pretty amazing for the moon. We found water on the moon. Imagine that, water on the moon. The moon is thought to be depleted because, of course, it's got no atmosphere at the present time. And it is thought, because of its birth, to have been devolatilized. But over the years, with improved technology, we've been able to, in fact, find water in the rocks, OK, from new analyses in these uh, volcanic glass beads. We see water sequestered, evidence for water sequestered in permanently shadowed regions in the crust. And we see, in fact, evidence for it on the surface, waxing and waning as a function of uh, night and day on the surface of the moon. This is revolutionary, and it's helped us to understand a key aspect of the moon. How did the moon form? Now, if you want to know something about the early history of the Earth, it's imperative to, to, to know if it's had any, you know, we all know people, we all know ourselves. If you had a traumatic experience as a child, sadly, it, it definitely influences uh, your future. It's a sad situation. Well, the Earth underwent one of those sad situations. It's humming along in its early years, and a Mars-sized object, one half its diameter, plows into it and ejects material, as you can see in this model here, which ultimately forms the moon. This is thought to have devolatilized uh, the moon, the material forming the moon. On the other hand, we're finding all these volatiles now. It doesn't discredit completely the hypothesis, but what it does is gives modelers a lot more information, which they have to constraints, which they have to realize, uh, in fact, to see what's going on in terms of how this ejecta happens. There have to be places where volatiles are, in fact, kept in uh, this environment and not completely lost. And this is not just a challenge, but new models are being uh, built all the time. So this is our early history of the Earth, a traumatic event. We have to start not just with a proto-Earth, but with an event like this. So we can see from this clock then, again, this is what we have now. This is what the moon is providing us. So the good news is we're on the right track because, in fact, the moon is providing us with a lot of insight into processes that are operating in early solar system history, ones that we would not suspect if we had just dealt with the Earth. So let's go back to this model and go to the next one here. Okay, We're going to go to Mercury, which is, in fact, uh, one-third the diameter of the Earth. And you can see Mercury is the innermost of the terrestrial planets. It's one-third the diameter, but its density is between Venus and the Earth. How does that happen? That's incredible. I mean, that's incredible. It's really dense. Well, it's thought, in fact, that during the formation of the collapsing solar nebula and the formation of the planets, that the temperature pressure distribution from the collapsing solar nebula in to outward uh, was, in fact, uh, decreasing uh, temperature and pressure as you went from the inner and outer. So increasing temperatures and pressures and siderophile elements were the ones that were stable in these environments where water and other volatile elements are driven out to the outer solar system to create the gas giants. So right away we have, you know, pretty good laboratory for the study of how this sort of thing works. And in fact, Mercury has been explored for decades. The first mission went in uh, 1973, Mariner 10. And the question was, we knew it had uh, uh, slightly larger than the moon, but containing an a iron core the size of the moon, based on the density arguments, what would the geology look like? What's a planet look like that has a core larger than uh, the Earth does, okay, by a lot, okay? So Mariner 10 saw, in fact, that it was a moon-like Mercury. A little bit disappointing in some ways, but whoa, really interesting in others, okay? 
So it showed that it was moon-like, impact craters dominate the surface, and there's these planes here. They look like volcanic planes, but we couldn't be sure because we didn't have enough instruments on board to get their mineralogy, et cetera. So Mariner 10 uh, discovered a lot of things. Uh, we discovered that it was a one-plate planet, but we only had 45% coverage of the surface. So it's one of those things uh, that you wake up in the middle of the night and go, I have a hypothesis, but I wonder what's on the other 55% that might uh, you know, make that less than a ball, uh, viable hypothesis. That's why Messenger was sent, and that's why Bepi Colombo, the ESA mission, is going to be uh, launched in the not too distant future uh, to follow up these really interesting questions. So these are the kind of questions that compel us, uh, and Messenger, of course, is still in orbit around Mercury, and it's uh, going to be in orbit for another eight or nine months. Uh, the orbit is decaying at the present time, and it's been amazing uh, to see what this has done. First of all, it's resolved the question about volcanism. Now, Apollo 16 landed right here in the Central Highlands to sample these bright planes that are, are brighter than the Mari and much more like the surrounding areas. If you can see here these planes, people thought they were volcanic in origin because it looks like they're ponding inside these craters here. Apollo 16 astronauts, they found, in fact, that they're impact breaches. So we found from Apollo 16 that impact breaches can mimic volcanic activity. So it's like, is it volcanic activity or is it impact deposits? And it wasn't easy to tell. Well, the first three flybys of Messenger on the way going into uh, Mercury orbit, in fact, showed unequivocally that volcanism was an important process. Volcanic vents, flow fronts, impact crater embayment relationships, basin filling, uh, and ages. We could get sequent significantly different ages. We saw pyroclastic deposits and even some candidate intrusive deposits, et cetera. So we unequivocally showed volcanism was important on the surface. What we didn't see were typical volcanic landforms. We did not see a Hawaii, a big volcano like on Mars we'll talk about in a while, shield fields, uh, rifted rises, et cetera, all the things that are typical of large planetary bodies with significant scale lengths of convection. We didn't see any of that. So, so why not? Well. What we did see as we went into orbit was the northern high latitudes, and this area here you can see is deficient in craters. All these red dots are craters. We could not distinguish differences in the ages of this 6% of the surface, and it was definitely volcanic in origin. We could see that from the spectra, et cetera. But 6% of the surface of Mercury was in place over a period of time which we couldn't distinguish, okay? It could have been all at the same time. 6%, how does that work? Here it is put on the moon, it's almost as much Mari basalt, basalt is, as exists on the moon as a whole over billions of years. Here it is superposed on the Earth. It goes from central Canada all the way down to Mexico and across from coast to coast. It's huge. It's huge. And it all is of the same age. I mean, this is not something you're looking for to see if it will happen on the Earth because, well, you know, maybe it's a good thing for the Midwest of the U.S. I don't know. We can have these debates, but nonetheless. Okay, so. Uh, sorry, that's a little political U.S. thing. It's a long story. It's a good way to wipe out the red states if you get my drift there. But anyway, okay, so, so how, could this, how could this happen? Okay, how could we get something like this? Well, one clue came from the thickness of the mantle. If we take a look at the mantles, all scaled to uh, one unity here, if you will, so, so to speak, you'll see that Mercury's is, in fact, relatively thin, in fact, very thin. So maybe it's the scale length of convection that's important. Maybe that's a critical thing. So we've been looking at what happens with the thermal evolution of a planet and a scale length of the convection when you have this kind of uh, configuration. So on the Earth, we have these rising plumes and we hit, get these features like Hawaii and typically volcanism is relatively narrow dikes, one to maybe five meters thick, et cetera, wide, et cetera. And you get typical eruptions like you see here. But maybe the other option is the thin mantle where convection here is inhibited and the mantle is in fact heating up as a whole. You're getting a lot of melt in the mantle it stresses the outer boundary layer, the lithosphere, and cracks it. And when it does, it has a huge amount of magma waiting to come out. Maybe this is what's going on. So we're struggling with this right now. But the evidence is clear that it's not the same. And it may be dike widths, just simply stressing of the lithosphere, outpourings of huge amounts of lava, uh, which is the case on Mercury. So this is really interesting because it brings new thoughts to how crustal formation and evolution might work. Is there a primary crust? on Mercury like there is on the Moon? The answer it seems to be no. We don't see any evidence for plagioclase feldspar-rich flotation primary crust on Mercury. Uh, in fact, abundant evidence for global thick volcanic deposits, but they're similar to secondary crust on the Moon and Mars. So this raises the issue. If you have, float, if you have an early impact bombardment crust, plagioclase on the Moon turns out, flotation turns out to be a function of temperature and pressure regimes, and maybe it doesn't work on other planetary bodies. There has to be a primary crust with all the accretion 
but in fact, maybe it doesn't work the same way. This is critically important because imagine uh, the nature of a primary crust on planets like Mercury, which could in fact be largely related to the way secondary crusts work, but in fact, in a vertically accreting evolutionary body. This has got huge implications for the early history of the planets, particularly the Earth. So we were able to see with the instrumentation on board lots about the mineralogy and composition. You can see a big impact basin here. Uh, you can see variations. We, we know there's an iron poor crust, iron poor mantle. Uh, all of these things help us, together with the geophysical tracking of the satellite, et cetera, try to understand the density interior structure. And mercury is really, really fascinating. This is a, a topic of a lot of discussion at the present time, uh, a paper by Hauk et al., 2012. Uh, 410 kilometer depths to the liquid boundary. There seems to be, what we're trying to do is match up what we think we know about the, the, the elemental abundances and the crust and the density structure of the interior and work through a whole series of models, the most prominent of which suggests that there's a solid iron sulfide core layer here. And this has huge implications for the temperature boundary across this uh, threshold here between uh, the liquid core and, uh, and the mantle. So this is new thoughts, okay? These are kind of new things in terms of what's going on in terms of the internal evolution of Mercury, as well as a comparison to the Earth and the thermal structure of the Earth's core, core mantle boundary. We also saw global tectonic scarp systems. Now, and when Mariner 10 went by, we saw these scarps. They were a kilometer high. Could they be global in nature? Surely they represented some shrinkage of the planet as a whole, but how much, okay? The global coverage of Messenger was able to get us to, to, to say what that was, okay? We could map them all out, measure them, and look at the... Turns out it's about seven kilometer radius difference. Now, no one in this room will remember this probably, but there was a period of time before plate tectonics when people thought it might have been shrinkage of the Earth that in fact caused uh, underthrusting and the kind of features we see with mountain belts. Plate tectonics took care of that theory, but maybe it's alive on Mercury. Uh, and in fact, we see lots of evidence for this. And maybe this is how plate tectonics starts. When we think about this massive underthrusting, maybe the Earth underwent a small density or small variation in the thermal structure or density structure early in its history, which could have caused global contraction, and that may have been something that might have started uh, plate tectonics. Just a thought, but these are things we think about as we look at these other planetary bodies. So we're now looking at these types of things, comparing the interior evolution of both of these bodies, and there's a lot more ahead. Now, who would have thought on Mercury, of all places, we would actually, so close to the sun, we would actually get evidence for ices in the permanently shadowed regions uh, of the polar regions, okay? So think about digging an impact crater with an impact on the, right at the pole. That thing does, gets no sunlight, and so volatiles, like a cometary impact or volatiles from volcanism, they, it, in fact, migrate to the poles because they're coal traps, and then they build up there. Well, we, we see ices in spades, okay? That means a lot, okay, uh, for you non-card players. Um, it, in fact, in the interior of these craters in the polar regions of Mercury. It's just amazing, okay? We can actually see it with our instruments, with the topography, uh, and uh, geochemical instruments, neutron spectrometers, et cetera. And what's going on is that there's sh permanently shadowed areas which, in fact, are protecting the ice that accumulates there. Not only that, we program the imaging system so that we can take very low-light images. For example, when the sun comes here, there's a tiny bit of scattered light that, that actually illuminates this, but not enough to mobilize the volatiles. These are images of that permanently shadowed material. We actually have images of the surface. It's just amazing, okay? So we're analyzing these to try to understand how old the deposits are, how long they stay there, and what they're composed of. Very, very interesting. Well, let's go to Mars, the third of these. Mars is the one half the diameter of the moon and, uh, of uh, Earth and, and Venus, so maybe we're getting to plate tectonics and things like that. Uh, as we increase in size and, and uh, retain more heat. Uh, it's also the outermost of the terrestrial planets. Uh, its density is more closer to the moon than it is to, to the Earth, and it has an atmosphere, okay? Its atmosphere is carbon dioxide, uh, just a few millibars of carbon dioxide. Well, it's interesting. The moon is kind of like moon mercury with water and climate, okay? So, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's got all the things that the moon and mercury have. We see from the distribution of craters here that it's a one-plate planet. It's a single global lithospheric plate. So the three smaller terrestrial planetary bodies all have uh, these single global lithospheric plates and do not have plate tectonics. And we can see back to over four billion years uh, on each of these, okay? So the significant record of early impact history in volcanism is preserved in the crust, but it differs in really fundamental ways. In this area here, the Tharsis region, which is staring right at, at you here, thousands of kilometers across, 10 kilometers high with 20-kilometer-high volcanoes sitting on top. 
is not the lunar maria. This is something totally different. It's not like anything we see on the Earth at the present time. And it's really mysterious because, in fact, it's gone on for four billion years. How you maintain chemical anomalies, thermal anomalies at depth to create and support this huge edifice, plus individual volcanoes on the surface. You know, you can say, oh, no plate tectonics, it's a hot spot, it sits there and, you know, kind of like dumps lava out for decades or millions of years. Uh, but this is, this is billions of years, okay? So how do you keep that heat source going? How do you keep the mantle, fertile mantle in there uh, to derive these rocks? So one of the key things is about the internal evolution is the Tharsis rise and huge volcanoes, hundreds of kilometers across. These are flanking rift zones of Arcea Mons, which is this volcano right here. And you can see there are radial dikes that extend away from this for hundreds and hundreds, up to 1,000 kilometers. Uh, the scale of these things here, this is a state of Arizona, probably not well known to many of you, but most of you know the size of, of Mount Everest and Mauna Kea here, and that's the size of Olympus Mons above uh, the uh, surface of, of Mars. So next time you're flying at 35,000 feet, think about how much higher you'd have to fly to get over Olympus Mons. It's humbling when you think about it. So how does this work? We don't know. The other thing is that we have incredible climatic record. We really want to know the history of the atmosphere. Why is Mars' atmosphere only about six or seven millibars at the present time? Was it different in the past? Well, we know Mars has a beautiful polar cap here. This is a th underlying this haze is a three kilometer polar cap. It's hundreds of kilometers across. You can see weather patterns. Look at this front moving through. Look at the cyclonic disturbance here. We now know how this works. Uh, basically, uh, the major reservoir of ice, uh, water ice, is the polar caps. It gets exchanged with the atmosphere. The atmosphere is very dry. H2O, CO2, absorption, desorption. And every time you change the obliquity of Mars, uh, this is interrupted. And in fact, redistribution of water ice takes place. On the other hand, when we go back in history, the deep past, we see evidence. Oh, by the way, liquid water is not stable in this pressure temperature environment. Okay, it's essentially a hyperarid, hypothermal, very, very cold, very dry desert and liquid water is not stable. It's just like CO2 on the Earth where it goes straight from the solid state to the vapor state, okay? But in the past, we see tons of evidence for flowing water. Look at these valleys here, uh, dendritic patterns. They're all dry now. And we see lots of evidence that suggests that there was a vertically integrated hydrological cycle in the first part of, of the history of Mars. And we have the geological record to look at this. This is just so amazing. Four and a half billion years of history laid out in front of us. It's just stunning. Here we are today. We can work our way back looking at the geological features. Uh, we can isolate uh, various change in the geology. And we also have, from uh, orbiting spacecraft, the mineralogical record. We can see here that this is very typical of the very dry, very cold, last three billion years of the history of Mars. But look, you go from anhydrous ferric oxide to clays separated by sulfates. So lots of water had to be going on here to cause this alteration. Where, what's with the sulfates? Where did they come from? Why did they dominate? the transition period, and what caused it to go from this, maybe a warm and wet climate, to this one, which is more like Antarctica, which we spend a lot of time looking at because the dry valleys are very much like this environment. So let's take a look and see how we can get at this uh, history. We've got three great things going for us here. First of all, we've got the robust geological record like I showed. And we also have from Jacques, Jacques Lescar a range of recent astronomical climate forcing values. So you know that the Earth's climate is uh, moderated by spin axis, orbital perturbations, eccentricity, uh, obliquity, and argument of the perihelion. The same is true of Mars. Mars does not have a big moon like the Earth, so Mars' obliquity is free, <laughs> bizarre as it's free to go to 70 or 80 degrees. You know, let's point the polar cap at the sun, see what happens. Okay, we're doing it here, okay, we can see this. We also have recent climate models from these individuals here, particularly Francois Forget in Paris. Um, recent climate models that can tell us what happens when we mobilize this ice. So all of these things tell us that significant amounts of polar water ice can be mobilized and transported equatorward during periods of higher obliquity. You tilt towards the sun, the axis, and then that gets mobilized and put into the surrounding areas. This is incredible. So we have the geological record. We have the predictions. We know what happens here. We can go back and look at these things. So we've been on a quest for uh, more than a decade to look at nonpolar, latitude-dependent, ice-related deposit. Well, that's a mouthful. What does it mean? We look for places which have, like, for example, what appear to be deposits related to tropical mountain glaciers, mantles on the surface, maybe some glaciated terrain. We date it, and then we work with our climate modelers to try to understand what's going on. In fact, we see in this roughness map here, this is an orbital roughness map, where you can see this orange textured uh, material from 30 north and south latitude to the poles. 
uh, is in fact indicative of a mantle of material which appears to be debris-covered ice uh, that dates back from the superposed craters just to the last few million years. And this is when Lascar predicts that the obliquity of Mars ramps up 400,000 years ago to 35 degrees. The mean obliquity doesn't change, but the amplitude changes 35 degrees. When that happens, ice gets mobilized from the poles, and in fact, it gets transported um, into the equatorial regions. And we published a paper in 2003, I think, which in fact talks about Mars in an ice age, where this is what Mars would look like just a few hundred thousand years ago at this obliquity. So we got lots of information about how to do this. We can also look at these things we mapped out as tropical mountain glaciers. I mean, what happens is at 45 degrees obliquity, polar ice is mobilized, it comes down the side of the Tharsis Plateau, goes up the side, adiabatically cools, and drops out snow and ice at the side of the volcanoes and produce a 170,000 square kilometer tropical mountain glacier. For you glaciologists, email me. I'll send you. It's just unbelievable. Drop moraines all over the... It's just incredible. And it's there. So we work with the climate modelers. We now know what happens at 45 degrees. It gets transported to the uh, equator. But let's take a look here, for example, at this um, early period. So this is the period of Mars that's very cold, very dry. Materials transported laterally across the surface uh, by these changes in obliquity. But what happens back here? What happens when we go back to the early warm and wet Mars? How did that happen? Here's a, uh, it, here's a series of uh, features here that you can see. Uh, these are uh, valley networks that come into the, this low area here. It's uh, lake deposits here, and these have flowed out here. So this is an open basin lake. Things flow in, they fill up the crater, and they flow out. So not only do we have dozens of these valley networks, hundreds of them, all these blue lines here, but we in fact have over 200 open basin lakes. So that's where the water flowed in, filled it up, flowed out. They're dry now, okay? But these are not trivial little ponds. They're of the scale of the Caspian Sea and Lake Baikal. These are huge. So water was flowing across the surface of Mars in its earliest history, and something happened to change it from clays and clay alteration uh, to sulfides and then also, uh, sulfates, and then, then finally into the cold and dry environment that's been typical of the last three billion years. Well, how do we find out what that transition's about? Well, the good news is, People are working together on this, and the Curiosity rover landing site was chosen to, in fact, look at that boundary. So Curiosity is wandering around the floor of Gale Crater, looking not just at these old deposits, but it's heading to these deposits here, which represent the transition between the Noachian deposits and the uh, uh, Hesperian deposits with these sulfates, etc. So we have a good chance of really cracking the code on this from the incredible spacecraft and rover that rep is represented by Curiosity. Well, let me finish Mars by asking this question. We know that Mars meteorites get delivered to Earth all the time. We pick them up in Antarctica. Uh, they're blasted there maybe a few millions of years off, off the surface of Mars. Um, and we know that the peak, peak shock, sorry, the peak flux was early in the history. That means there were a lot of meteorites coming in and making ejecta and dumping it in the solar system, transporting it to the Earth. A question you might ask is, what's going on in terms of the history of uh, life, okay? Could life have originated on Mars, okay? If life originated on Mars, it's very clear. It's easy to get to the Earth. Could the Earth's early ocean have been infertile, so to speak, uh, sitting and waiting for a meteorite from Mars to come splashing into the ocean and essentially seed the planet? So when you get up to Mars and look in the mirror, the search for Martians may be looking <laughs> back at you, okay? We don't know, but this is why the quest goes on to try to understand these environments on Mars. Well, let's get to the last planetary body here in this inner solar system. Venus is totally amazing. It's, of course, the same size as the Earth. It's very close to the Earth in its position in the solar system. Uh, and the size and density are very comparable, okay? So, in fact, you know, we hope that this will crack the code on another planetary body that looks a lot like the Earth and, in fact, may uh, look a lot like the Earth in its geological evolution. So we've seen the smaller terrestrial planetary bodies are all one-plate planets. In this mechanisms of lithospheric heat transfer, we can say that these are, in fact, dominated by lithospheric conduction. That's how they lose their heat. Uh, the Earth, of course, is dominated by plate recycling and, of course, continental heat loss from uh, radioactive elements. And the innermost satellite of the uh, Jupiter system, EO, loses its heat by advective cooling, by taking heated material and dumping it out straight to the surface, okay? Uh, so where does Venus fit in all this? Is it like the Earth, okay? Could it be like the Earth here? Uh, in this diagram, you're looking at the present to the origin of the planets. What these colors represent is a percentage of surface area that exist at the surface of the planet at the present time. 
So here you can see 60% of the surface is of ocean basins, and then a few percent here in continents, and it goes back to almost nothing, whereas the Moon, Mercury, and Mars reveal the earliest history. And where is Venus in this? Is it like the old planetary bodies? Is it like the Earth? Or is it somewhere in between? This is incredibly compelling. And indeed, is it characterized by a young surface, plate tectonics? Could it be ancient surface, globally unsegmented crust and lithosphere? Or does it represent something in between the Earth and a smaller terrestrial planetary bodies? As my colleague Tom Getchen always warned me, don't forget D, none of the above, OK? Because in fact, that's what it turned out to be. That's why exploration is so critically important. We got a peak of Venus uh, with the Pioneer 10 data. Uh, and in fact, this is a topographic map at 100 kilometer resolution. And uh, blue is low, red is high. Now, right away, you could imagine this looks a little like the Earth, like maybe uh, ocean basins, maybe continents. Whoa, if you like continents, look at these linear mountain belts. Look at these things here. And Arecibo radar data we got from the Earth, they have lines that look just like the full wavelength you would expect. Uh, and in fact, uh, this was really incredibly important as we prepared a new mission, Magellan, uh, to go to the uh, environment around Venus, that is the uh, orbital environment, uh, to get high-resolution data. So these things, like, it looked like a rifted rise, uh, maybe uh, plate tectonic lows, uh, maybe continental accretion, and et cetera, et cetera. A very, very enticing, raised a lot of questions, helped the cell in Magellan mission. And this was a beautiful mission. Global coverage with side-looking radar, altimetry, radiometry, uh, gravity structure. We went into orbit, lower orbit to get gravity structure, et cetera. Absolutely stunning. It was just so incredible to watch Venus uh, un, unroll, so to speak, before our eyes uh, an orbit at a time. So what do we find out? Well, volcanism dominates Venus. You know, I'm a volcanologist, so I'm thinking, gee, Mercury, that was a close call. We might not have had any volcanism. I'd be out of a job, you know. But Venus is like unbelievable. Venus is just wallpapered with volcanism. 80% of the surface is dominated by volcanism. And you can see here how beautifully it's preserved. Uh, these are steep-sided domes like the ones we saw on the moon, which in fact uh, may represent differentiation and uh, you know, silicic domes, et cetera, ranging to huge flows. Check the scales out here. It's just amazing. What you don't see here are a lot of impact craters. Ah, our first clue. Maybe Venus is young like the Earth, OK? So of course, what we want to find out is what is the age of the surface of Venus? Is it young? Is it old? Is it young? Is it something in between? So we want to do two things. We want to count all the impact craters on Venus and get an average age. Is it like? the Earth, or is it like the smaller terrestrial planetary bodies? Then we want to look for the places uh, that are, have larger numbers of craters, the old areas, like continents and things like that, and the younger ones uh, with no craters, uh, because that'll tell us where the activity is and match it up with all the morphology. So we did that, <clears throat> and we got a mean global surface age of about 500 million years. OK, so that's about the same as the Earth's, OK? Uh, the average age of Venus is like the Earth. Wow. That's incredible. That's amazing. It's not back here. It's all up here, more or less. Of course, we could have some older continental areas here like we do on the Earth. So we, we need to look at the next question, which is, what is the aerial distribution of ages? Where are the young units? Where are the old units? OK, so we started to do that. Let's plot the global distribution. Map gets pumped out. We sit around and look at it. And it's like, oh my god, what are we going to do here? So one plot is the observed distribution of impact craters on Venus. The five other plots are random distributions of impact craters created by a random number generator. And um, I know which one is the right one, OK? But you don't, OK? <laughs> and actually, I've forgotten to, so it's OK. But, it's, but that's the point, you know? I mean, it's just like, it's unbelievable. How can this happen? How can this be, OK? Well. What do we have here? Aerial distribution is indistinguishable from completely random. No major differences in the age of the majority of target units. Most impact craters, furthermore, most impact craters are pristine. They're not embayed by lava. We say, oh, which ones are embayed by lava? They're the old ones, blah, blah. No, uh, most are pristine and unmodified. Tectonically, almost all of them are tectonically unmodified, unembayed. There's no plate tectonics, no ancient continents, uh, no younger spreading centers. Uh, you know, what's going on here? What's going on here? This is not. This is the none of the above. What is going on here? So to many, this suggested rapid global resurfacing. Totally amazing. You know, rapid global resurfacing. Wait a minute. How do you? <laughs> this is an Earth-like planet. Okay. This is not a little Venus. Uh, uh, sorry, Mercury. We'll dump some lava out. Six percent. That's not bad. This is the whole planet. This is a hundred percent. Okay. So how do we do this? What Venus turned out to be is, in fact, eighty percent of the history is missing, and we have here the last few percent, uh, the last five to ten percent. And it looks like there was a peak resurfacing event, and then not much after that. How do we do that, OK? 
So the surface is predominantly volcanic in origin. There's no ancient heavily cratered terrain. We do have tessera. These are these extremely heavily modified uh, units, material, about 8% of the surface of the planet. These are stratigraphically the oldest deposits. Whatever happened involved a lot of tectonic activity followed by a lot of volcanic activity to resurface that. Uh, so, so how do we get to this, okay? This is the enigma. This is the, instead of answering all our questions about the early history of the Earth, uh, this seemed to put us off on another path. Is Venus completely unique? You know, in a totally terracentric statement, is it an Earth gone astray? You know, I mean, come on. So, but what, what's going on here, okay? It's possible that this could be really indicative of what is going on in the early Earth as well. So what do we got here? It must have undergone global scale resurfacing in its recent history. This is a scary thought when you're standing on an Earth-like planet, for crying out loud, okay? This resurfacing must have been geologically rapid. What could have caused it? Among the hypotheses, a transition from mobile lid to stagnant lid. That doesn't quite do it, but it's, you know, it's something to think about. Uh, episodic plate tectonics. You see things that maybe were plate tectonics, but if it shuts off, does it just shut off? And an interesting one is catastrophic overturn of a depleted mantle layer. Remember, this is a vertically accreting crust. The more you accrete, the more you build up a depleted mantle layer, and these undergo variations essentially from this vertical accretion. Temperature uh, and compositional buoyancy issues are created so that the bottom part of this whole pile becomes negatively buoyant, and in fact can founder and overturn, which would then seriously deform the surface, bring up fertile mantle, and in fact resurface the planet. I mean, think about that. This is a very distinct possibility. This is an Earth-like planet. So maybe Venus has been bobbing around in this mechanism of heat transfer diagram much more than, we, than we'd like to think, sitting on what we think is a stable planet. So Venus has huge implications. We've done a global geological map of Venus at about a 1 to 15 million scale. And so we know the distribution of units in space. All of these things are formed in a very short period of time. We know the distribution of units in time. We have a beautiful stratigraphy for Venus. And the question is, you know, why did this global tectonic regime formed by the tessera and the global volcanic regime formed by about 70% of the rest of the planet, okay, why did this occur so extremely rapidly? And then we ended up with a series of network rifting and small amounts of volcanism for the remaining period. This is one of the enigmas, and this is why Venus is so important. Venus is really, uh, Venus Earth comparative planetology is clearly a compelling way uh, to understand the early history of the Earth. When we take a look here, uh, people have tried to figure out what happened before this. A good way to do that is to go through stages in evolution of what we think every planet went through. Bullock and Grunspoon have done this. You can see the diagram here. What we have is what the aftermath, okay? but we don't know what went before. So let's take some of these things and try to figure out what the commonalities are and what the differences might be. And then maybe we can have a much better picture of the early history of Venus, its transition to this terrain, and then uh, essentially a much better picture of the Earth. And maybe this is what happened to the Earth. Vertical crustal accretion initially for a primary crust, which became negatively buoyant, overturned. Perhaps that's how plate tectonics started. We don't know, but we need your help uh, to help figure out this compelling question. So here we are then, the legacy, scientific results from exploration, the earth in perspective. I mean, for me personally, it's been an incredible time to be alive because I was looking at those many off zones before plate tectonics. I will remember that sound from Sputnik, okay? And I've experienced all these things in between. It's just amazing, I mean, it's just an amazing time. And we're really getting a picture of the early history of the earth, the earth in context, and beginning to understand our own home planet significantly. So we're beginning to ask, you know, we have a missing, we have a perspective on the first half of solar system history. We're asking fundamental questions about crustal formation, looking at what happened on Mercury and the moon. Uh, we have impact cratering. We know it's a fundamental process. Early Earth was hit by a Mars-sized object, many impact basins in early Earth history. And by the way, we wouldn't be sitting in this room today. It would be dinosaurs uh, here if it hadn't been for an impact, okay? That's what opened up us to be able to be what we are today, honestly, okay? Well, there were a few things that happened in between, but nonetheless, that, that's the main one, okay? So we have atmospheric evolution. How do we get to the current greenhouse Venus? Could that happen to the Earth? What went on there? We see radical climate change on Mars. Uh, we, we see lots of evidence for several snowball Earths. How can we understand how that all works? And of course, we have new perspectives on hospitable environments, okay? So the last 57 years has been absolutely stunning. But wait, there's more for you young people who think, well, we've taken everything and you don't, there's nothing left. Look at all the questions we have, but there's even more because, in fact, there's two things that are going on here. The answers to the many outstanding questions 
will rely on the results of space missions to be undertaken and designed by you all uh, for the next 50 years. Whoever does it, I mean, who knows who's going to do it, okay? Uh, hopefully we can all work together to do it. And better than that, there's a new era of not just comparative planetology, but comparative planetary systems. We're discovering planets around other stars at an alarming rate, okay? We used to be unique. Forget it, okay? It's just amazing. So comparative planetary systems is the future, and we'll be able to understand much more about our home planet from our perspective of the solar system and other solar systems around other stars. It's an exciting time. Thank you very much. <laughs>